So we're here near the mouth of the Saranac River, looking across the river at the McDonough Monument and behind the monument, uh, City Hall, Plattsburgh City Hall. We're here to talk about the story of building the Thomas McDonough Memorial Monument and some other things that were happening around its building at the same time. And it really begins in 1913 when something called the Plattsburgh Centenary Commission is formed and they're given two main tasks. One is to celebrate the centennial of the Battle of Plattsburgh the following year, and this they do with great success and fanfare, thanks in part to a $50,000 in public funding that, that they got. Their other task was to plan for the building of a suitable monument to commemorate Thomas McDonough's victory in Plattsburgh Bay. First thing they do is they decide where is this going to be located in the city. And they choose this location here largely because it was had this vantage point of being able to see Plattsburgh Bay where the battle took place. And also it was right on this site where a lot of the land battle was taking place as well. This was a very appropriate site. So they presented the site as kind of a blank canvas. They invited 20 architects to submit uh, proposals for a, a monument. And they unanimously chose the design of John Russell Pope from New York City. And his design is more or less as we see it today, a large uh, freestanding obelisk in the center of the site. This was not an open site at the time. The other thing that the commission had to do was to condemn 11 parcels of land on what was uh, called North River Street at the time. And uh, this they did at a cost of something like $65,000. They demolished the buildings. They did some basic site work so that the, the work could actually uh, commence. You know, what's interesting is that the idea of designing a monument here also inspired a couple of other related projects. One was the city decides at the same time to build a new city hall. And this is done through a grant from a local philanthropist named Loyal Smith. And the city decides to also uh, hire John Russell Pope, the architect for the monument, to design the city hall. And the design of the city hall is based upon a Roman building called the Pantheon, which has a domed roof and a classical colonnade uh, facing the street. And uh, the progress for building the city hall actually is much faster than the monument. I think the city hall is finished in uh, 1917. Uh, the other thing that's, that it gets inspired by this work going on is the Shazy philanthropist William Minor decides to purchase the Kent de Lord House Museum just down the road to create a local history museum. Its importance was mainly in the early 19th century, the same time that all of this other, the Battle of Plattsburgh stuff was going on. So you've got the monument, City Hall, the creation of the, the Kent de Lord House Museum, all being developed at the same time. So what was it that attracted the commission to Pope's design for the McDonough Monument? I guess the first thing to remember is that Pope was uh, a New York-based architect. He was trained at Columbia University. He went to the Ecole de Beaux-Arts in Paris, and he was really trained in neoclassical design, and he built country homes and urban office buildings but he was really best known for building uh, monuments like this and also grand civic government buildings. And so the monument and city hall were really right up his alley. This is actually fairly early on in his career. He eventually does uh, three hugely important works in Washington, D.C., including the National Archives, the National Gallery of Art, and most of us will know him for the Jefferson uh, Memorial. All of these government memorial projects really uh, done in a neoclassical, classical revival style. And the idea of using an obelisk like this to be the center of a memorial like this was, by the time this was designed, already pretty well established, uh, both in Europe and uh, in, in America. And the, the obelisk is, comes out of ancient Egypt, and it was something that the pharaohs would construct to, as a demonstration of their, their power, as a demonstration of their you know, connection uh, to God, to the divine. And when 
Egypt began to be opened up to the West in the early 19th century as European archaeologists started to do archaeological work in Egypt and frankly plunder a lot of Egyptian objects, the West got very excited about all things Egyptian, not unlike after Japan gets opened up after our Civil War, the United States gets very interested in all things Japan. And such was the sort of fervor towards things um, Egyptian that when a 75-foot obelisk from Luxor in Egypt gets transported to Paris to be re-erected there, 200,000 people gather, including the king and queen, to see it lifted up to place in the Place de Concorde. And following that, I think that's 1836, following that, London gets its own Egyptian obelisk, New York gets its own Egyptian obelisk, and this period of obelisk building really takes off in, in full force. The first obelisk built in the United States was designed by Solomon Willard at Bunker Hill in Massachusetts to commemorate the Revolutionary War battle there and that was also built in the 1830s. Following that, obelisks are built as part of the Lincoln Mausoleum. There's one at the battlefield at uh, Groton Heights. There's one at Saratoga. There's one at Bennington. And so they begin to pop up all over the United States in these battlefield memorial uh, locations. So that by the time Pope designs this here, they're already pretty well established. This is what's called a monumental obelisk. It's a little different than what you would have found in ancient Egypt. Those would have been made out of solid stone, either single piece or blocks of stone stacked on top of each other. These were meant to be hollow, many pieces of stone, and often they had a staircase, as this one does, going up through the center of it so there could be an observation deck on the top and especially in battlefield locations or in locations like this where you want people to be able to see Plattsburgh Bay and see where this action took place, that was a really important feature. And the biggest of these monumental uh, obelisks was of course the Washington Monument in Washington DC. I think that is 550 feet tall, finished I think in 1885, the tallest uh, obelisk uh, in the world and the tallest stone structure in the world, all of this, this, this basic vein. It was very appropriate that this kind of design was uh, selected for the site here. Now what happens is World War I comes along and the funding for the continuation of this goes away until the war is over and the task of building the monument picks up again in 1921 under the United States Corps of Engineers and they go out to bid with the design. The cost estimates come back too high. They redo some of the site work. They, it goes out to bid again. Again, the costs for building it are too high and it goes out a third time. The final design pushes the monument back closer to what we now call City Hall Place, therefore requiring a lot less site work and finally it gets awarded uh, to a New York firm. Construction begins and it's finished and dedicated in 1926. One of the things that uh, survives is a whole series of wonderful black and white images of the monument being erected with scaffolding all around it. And you can see it kind of growing uh, day by day and that's, that's, a, that's a great thing to look at. The commissioners were really specific about what they thought the eagle represented. What they prescribed for the, the design of the eagle was it was to look like the bird was landing on top of the monument. I'll read what they said about the eagle. They said the idea was that the eagle would be alighting after a long flight, conveying the thought that this republic, which for a quarter century following the close of the Revolutionary War, had been little more than a group of separate struggling states, had finally been welded together by the War of 1812, brought to a successful ending in part because of the battle here, into a strong and determined nation which finally found permanence, safety, and peace. The eagle had alighted. That was, that was their interpretation of the eagle. At the base of the monument, which is 135 feet high and 14 foot square at the, the base, are some inscriptions telling part of the story of McDonough and the victory here 
which was also typical of what you found at the base of these monuments. William McKinley was assassinated uh, in, in Buffalo in the early 20th century, and in his honor, uh, there was a monument to William McKinley built in Buffalo in 1907, and it was an obelisk uh, like this. And on the occasion of the dedication of that monument, the, the very well-known poet Carl Sandburg wrote a, a poem uh, about the monument, uh, and one of the lines in it says, a forefinger of stone dreamed by a sculptor points to the sky. It says, this way, this way. Again, what he's getting at is, you know, the inspirational task that the monument was supposed to be for people that came to this site. This whole idea that you would tear down blocks of a city, both for the monument and for City Hall, was part of a movement in late 19th and early 20th century America called the City Beautiful Movement. And the idea here was, you know, kind of pretty marvelous to create public open spaces, to allow sunshine and fresh air into the city, to build grand works of architecture that were supposed to inspire people. And there's even a suggestion that uh, works like the Monument in City Hall would help to improve, you know, the city's moral and civic virtues. It was really, really aspirational. And I, I just love the idea that at least in this period, people understood that architecture could have a, a role in, in something so lofty. I, I think today we've forgotten that architecture is important, that it can be inspiring, that it is a reflection of who we are uh, today. And I think the fact that the city of Plattsburgh took up these two projects really says something really wonderful about the city at the time. It embraced its history, it was optimistic about its future, and it wanted to create an inspirational setting for its citizens. And I think that's all, that's all pretty cool. Another thing that interests me about all of this is, you know, in the early 20th century, who it was and what it was that we chose to honor through creating monuments. And in a lot of the examples I gave you at battlefields, we were honoring war heroes, military campaigns, military victories, and that was very, that was very common. And if I think about what kind of monuments we're still building today, I'm thinking about some of the recent monuments built in Washington, D.C. There's the monument to the Vietnam War, which doesn't glorify the war, but instead speaks to the pain of the war for the country and the loss of life there. If you go to the Korean War monument, it's a series of these bronze figures, these men in all of their gear, almost like slogging through a field on their way uh, to battle. It speaks to the human sacrifice. It speaks to the pain of war, to the sacrifice that individuals made uh, to make that possible, rather than some grand victory or rather than some general. So I think even when we're honoring war, uh, we're doing it in, in a really different way. The other new monuments there are to Martin Luther King, a civil rights hero, to FDR for all of his work to heal the country, to bring the country back together following the Depression, taking us through World War II, and of course a very important American. And of course, these days we're living in a period where we're questioning the monuments that we've erected previously, and we're realizing that it isn't appropriate to erect monuments to Civil War generals who were traitors to their own nation and, and, and took up the cause of succession and took up the cause of slavery, that that isn't appropriate anymore. Even uh, you know, sort of people that have always been seen as great figures in American history were looking a little bit more closely at their lives, seeing their flaws, seeing their hypocrisy sometimes, and hopefully making good choices about where and when it's appropriate to honor you know, such people. I don't see this as an effort to erase history at all, but in a public place, I think it's, it, it says something about who we are, who we choose, and what we choose to commemorate. And I think we have to be very uh, careful in what we erect and who and what we honor. 
and I'm, I'm glad to be in this place in the 21st century where we're being much more thoughtful about all of these things. You know, in retrospect, I don't think we would ever today erect such a monument to, to Thomas McDonough and the Battle of Plattsburgh in, in, uh, in 1814, but I, I sure am glad they did because this is a, a wonderful public landscape. This site is, has some wonderful architecture to it. It is a place that brings people together to gather, to reflect. All kinds of community events happen here. And as a gathering place, it's really wonderful. And so I think it's something we should be really proud about.